Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where I show you some photos and then tell you about them and then show you some more photos and tell you about them. And the whole thing just keeps on repeating in a never ending spiral until the end of time. Today is episode 13 and 13 traditionally is an unlucky number. But as fate would have it, that's exactly what I want to talk about today. Bad luck in photography. Ow! Jesus! Sorry. So the subject of luck in photography and street photography in particular is quite a common one. You'll forever hear of photographs being referred to as a lucky shot and some photographers are even known as lucky photographers. But what's less commonly remarked upon, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, many of those lucky photographs are by extension unlucky for the subject of that photograph. This is a photograph that I took literally outside my own front door a few years back. And obviously the poor truck driver was having a really bad morning, but I was absolutely cock a hoop to have seen this. Bad luck for him, good luck for me. And don't worry, the woman was just passing through. She was unhurt. Full disclosure, by the way, I live in a bit of an accident black spot. So uh, just a little bit further up my road, I've also photographed this. And this, different cars, both trying and failing to get through the same width restriction in a novel way. And then a little bit further down the road, I took this. But I don't want to do an entire episode on flipped over cars that I've seen. I'd rather take a look at the whole subject of bad luck in general and how for as long as people have been using cameras, uh, it's been an irresistible magnet for photographers. Um, accidents obviously are unpredictable unless you live on my road where they occur with alarming regularity but street photographers are always alert always out and about and looking for stuff to photograph and so throughout history throughout photographic history we have great examples of the universality of bad luck I've already shown you this photo by Paul Martin in my film on the history of British street photography, but I think it's worth looking at again here because it's the earliest example I can find of the genre. This was a horse-drawn carriage accident from 1894 in High Holborn in London, and Martin was simply in the right place at the right time to get the woman being rescued by the policeman and the crowd of passers-by all watching. Now that was a very routine, everyday accident, but now take a look at this by our old friend, the pioneering French photographer, Jacques-Henri Lartige from 1922, which is just spectacular and iconic. Lartige was a bit of an action junkie, and I can't help but think of this photo when I also look at another photo of his from even earlier. He took this one in 1911, which now contains an astonishing air of menace. Nothing bad has actually happened here yet, but it's the potential of something tragic and awful befalling the couple and their baby under the fragile, possibly plummeting plane that I simply can't get out of my head. I'm going to zip through a few more stone cold classics here. Um, obviously, I've talked about Robert Frank and the Americans on several occasions in the past, but this one was actually taken a bit earlier by him in Paris in 1949. And I have no idea what happened here, but it's fascinating to see in the light of some of the photos that are going to be coming up how Frank chose to frame the body out. He's far more concerned with the faces of the witnesses who almost look like they're queuing up to stare. Bad luck or tragedy presented as spectacle is a recurring theme in this genre. A few years later in America, Frank came across a fatal road accident, which isn't very surprising given that he spent more than a year driving all over the US. And this is a very sad and very solemn record of an event that's more common than any of us care to imagine. So I've been searching for bad luck and accident photos for quite a while now. And the other day I came across a pair that I absolutely couldn't believe. Um, and I'm gonna share them with you now. So here is a photo taken by Gary Winogrand in New York City in 1960. And it's a classic, confusing and busy street scene that pulls your eye and attention all over the place. The kind of thing that Winogrand specialized in. There's blood and a hat on the pavement the main focus of the image, if indeed there is one, seems to be this kid, a witness who's transfixed while strangely holding on to a pair of shoes. And again, like that earlier Robert Frank photo in Paris, all that we actually see of the victim are their feet in the bottom corner of the frame. What happened to him? We'll probably never know. Maybe it was the kid's father, maybe not. 
I doubt Winogrand could even have told you. It's just a great photograph made by his quick reflexes. But now I'm going to show you another photograph, also by Winogrand, uh, also in New York City, but this time taken in 1968. This one's a bit calmer, but it's also of another collapsed person on the pavement, this time a woman. And again, there's their hat on the ground and a transfixed kid watching on. And again, he's cropped the victim slightly out at the corner of frame. But have you spotted the truly amazing coincidence yet? Maybe it would help if I put them side by side. Seen it yet? There's a nun in each photo. How is this possible? Eight years apart, how does Gary Winogrand get two bad luck collapsed people on the street photographs and in each one there's a nun present? It simply defies belief. How lucky is that? Unless, of course, it's divine intervention and it's the same nun, a psychotic killer nun who roams the streets of New York, pushing people over and tripping them up and then trying to cover her tracks by helping. In 1967, the year before Winogrand's second accident attended by a nun photograph, his friend and fellow American street photographer, Joel Meyerwitz, who incidentally had snapped this terrifying gang of nuns back in 1965, shortly before they went on a bloody, murderous, theological, yet sadly unphotographed rampage across Manhattan. But I'm digressing again, sorry. Anyway, Meyerowitz was in Paris in 1967 uh, when he took this photograph, which is arguably the best bad luck accident street photograph of all time. What has just happened here? Again, we'll never really know. All we do know is that Meyerowitz could not have been better placed to capture this man's bad luck and his fall. This photograph actually exerts a gravitational pull on anyone who looks at it. It sucks you into the centre, but the real brilliance is how he's caught the exact moment when virtually everyone in shot is focused on the victim. The bloke on the bike turning back, the bloke with the trolley load of boxes, the commuters going down to the metro, and most importantly, the bloke with the hammer, who, in a kind of Cluedo-like inference, could be the perpetrator, or maybe he's completely innocent and is rushing to help. It's a real shame that once again, Meyerowitz just missed the nun, who had fled seconds earlier after flattening the poor bloke with a swift right hook. What's fascinating to me is that street photographers, who are people that are out and about uh, looking for stuff all the time, uh, very rarely have more than two or three great examples of street bad luck within their entire back catalogue. Cities are just so concentrated, so busy and so full of people, it's impossible for one photographer to get them all. And also, coincidentally, if you look at the photographers that I've mentioned so far, or, or most of them, you know, uh, Frank, Winogrand and Meyerowitz, they're all based in or from New York City. And uh, New York City has a tremendous history of bad luck photography. You can plot a direct line from Frank to Winogrand to Meyerowitz and then on to, say, Jeff Mermelstein, who took this great photo of a blazing camper van for his book Sidewalk. And now look up at the top of frame and you'll see how he's also purposely included all the people watching on from their windows. And I also love how this fireball is taking place outside an art gallery. No nuns present, though, which is a shame. Here's another shot by Mermelstein. This time not in New York City, but actually in Yosemite National Park, which fools you brilliantly into thinking you're looking at a crash victim before you realise that this is after the event, and that's a contorting policeman inspecting the wrecked vehicle. And now there's a new generation of New York City photographers like Daniel Arnold and Aaron Berger, who are also out there and quick and alert enough to any accident or misfortune that they might have the good fortune to stumble across. But here's the thing. All the photographers that we looked at so far only have a few examples of this in their back catalogue. It's just a thing that you see if you're lucky and by extension someone else is unlucky. But there are some photographers out there who go out of their way to go and photograph bad luck. Photographers for whom it is an obsession and a job and often both. And for the rest of this episode, I want to take a look at three of the absolute best of the best. Ouija, Enrique Metanides and Andrew Savulik. So what I'm going to do is try and give you a brief-ish introduction to each photographer. Uh, I'll explain what they have in common, how they differ 
and what looking at their photos can tell us about bad luck uh, and indeed life, ethics and what it means to be alive. So we're going to start with Ouija. I'll do this in chronological order and you can't discuss this kind of photography without including Ouija and without acknowledging his genius but he was quite a complicated, contradictory character and it's going to be a real struggle to do him justice in a little film like this, but let's give it a go. He was born in 1899 in what is now um, a part of the Ukraine, uh, but back then was an Eastern European town called uh, Zolochev. Um, his real name is Usher Felig and his parents were Orthodox Jews. And like so many others, they fled Europe looking for a better life. Usher arrived in New York City aged 10 and his name was instantly westernised at Ellis Island to Arthur. And Arthur's family was poor, really poor. He was the second of seven children and they all lived in tenement slum buildings on the Lower East Side. But Arthur was enraptured with his new home. He left school at 14, fell out with his traditional religious parents and started working and trying to earn a living. And by the age of 15 he had left home permanently and for a while he lived on the streets, slept in train stations and flop houses and did whatever he could to survive. And during this time he also fell in love with photography. Apparently a street photographer made his portrait and that was it for Arthur. He was hooked. He'd found his lifelong obsession. So he started off as a photographer's assistant uh, and then he got his own camera and what he did was he rented a pony and he would take the pony round the neighbourhood, sit the local kids on top of the pony, take a photo of them both and then flog those photos to the parents. Uh, but then apparently he had an argument with the stable owner, apparently arguments were very big in Ouija's life and he lost use of the pony. Sadly I can't find any of those photos that Arthur took of kids atop a pony. I found this much later cheesy publicity shot which might have been a nod back to his humble beginnings and I also found this photo which is a photo he might have taken of kids in a New York street playing near a dead horse which has just been killed by a nun. Arthur got a series of jobs which were all to do with photography although he did also have a job uh, briefly playing the violin uh, in a cinema orchestra and he said he loved to observe how his music affected the audience watching the big screen and this playing on and with people's emotions was something he would later master with his photography. He got a job sweeping floors in a photography studio where he soon graduated to taking photos for catalogues for salesmen, one of which was apparently photographing coffins, something the older Ouija would go on to do frequently. Remember this was the 1920s, the time of prohibition, murder incorporated and mobsters running amok. It was a totally different world. Arthur then caught a break when he got a job at the New York Times in their dark rooms and his first job was to dry the prints with a squeegee and this is one of the theories about how he later got his name Ouija is that it's an abbreviation of the term squeegee boy because for a while in the early 20s Arthur was the best squeegee boy in the business. Pretty soon though he left the New York Times and got a better position working for Acme News Pictures in 1927 as a darkroom printer. Acme was an agency that employed 30 full-time photographers and had darkrooms, editors and retouchers working around the clock supplying newspapers in New York and around the country with photographs. So Arthur became part of the furniture there. He rapidly became their best printer. He would often sleep in the offices and he was obsessed and he learned exactly what editors wanted. Remember he wasn't yet a photographer, he was a printer so he was seeing everything that the other photographers were taking and he would also see what was accepted by the editors and what was rejected. It was an amazing full-on education. Here's some early photos of Arthur in the Acme offices in 1932 goofing about, playing the trumpet and even being beaten with a gas can by his manager George Watson. Gradually Arthur started taking his own photographs. He would accompany some of the photographers out on assignment. Here's a really grainy old photo of him with his camera and the press pack outside police headquarters in 1934 with his trademark hat and speed graphic camera. Now as you can see from that photograph uh, there was no shortage of uh, press and news photographers around at that time. Acme employed at least 30 and there were other agencies and freelancers too 
But why is Ouija so synonymous with this genre? Why has his name and have his photographs endured, whereas loads of others have been forgotten? Um, well, I think the main answer is, is that he just worked harder than anyone else, uh, primarily, um, by his own estimation, which might well be an exaggeration, between 1935 and 1945, he photographed 5,000 murders. He would often sleep in the offices, and then in 1934, he rented a one-room apartment directly over the road from police headquarters. He cultivated friendships with policemen, he had a whole network of informers, and basically, he never stopped working. By 1935, he was getting annoyed with the lack of credit his photos would get at Acme, so he went freelance. He knew that many of the other photographers had families and didn't like working the night shift, but that was where most of the murders and lots of the fires and accidents took place, and so that was what he focused on. And he was a natural, as one of the many books about him says, murder was my business. And just to rub that point in, Here's a check that he got from Time, made out for two murders. But in addition to his amazing instincts and work ethic, Arthur's other main advantage was that in 1938, he became one of the first civilians and certainly the first photographer to get a license to uh, install a shortwave radio into his car. This allowed him to listen in to all the police and fire and ambulance transmissions. And this was how he could beat all other photographers and arrive before them at the scene of the crime. And it also could be the other alternative origin of his name, because people would say it was like he had a Ouija board, a word that Arthur pronounced and then misspelt as Ouija, just like squeegee, and it stuck. Ouija would have a scanner in his car. He'd hear where the crimes were being reported, speed over there, take the photos and then develop them also in his car, which was a Chevrolet business coupe, which had no back seat, but an enormous trunk, which enabled him to convert it into a mobile office where he could type up stories and captions, so no one else could match his work rate. In 1940, a new daily newspaper was launched in New York called PM Daily, which was twice the price of any other paper, carried no advertising and employed writers such as Dashiell Hammett, Dorothy Parker and even Ernest Hemingway. PM Daily wanted to match its journalism with top-end photography, so photographers like Margaret Bourke-White, Helen Levitt and Ouija all worked for them. But Ouija's main reason for taking this job was that they were the first newspaper ever to give him a credit, photo by Ouija. And, as we'll go on to see, Ouija had a huge ego and craved recognition. So I'm going to show you a few of his classic photos now, um, and I should point out that there's quite a few photographs of dead bodies coming up from this point onwards in the film. Uh, so if you're squeamish and you don't like looking at this sort of thing, uh, you should probably be watching something else. This is the body of an ambulance driver called Morris Linker being retrieved from the East River on August the 24th, 1943. And the narrative power of this shot, Ouija's managed to get both the ambulance being hauled out as well as the driver, is quite exceptional. And then this one from 1941 called booked on suspicion of killing a policeman, which is so film noir-esque, it's almost a parody. And as we'll go on to see, Ouija was both enamoured by the movies and incredibly influential on the movies, particularly film noir. I should also briefly mention that I have looked very, very hard to try and find a Ouija photo, a Ouija accident photo, that also involves a nun. Uh, so I can therefore corroborate my far-fetched theory that psychotic killer nuns are running around the streets of New York based on those two Gary Winograd photos that I found. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any, although I did find this, which is that on July the 28th, 1945, the Empire State Building was hit by a B-25 bomber of the US Army that got lost in fog. Obviously, loads of press photographers, including Ouija, went along to take a look, but it was so foggy and this was all you could see from the ground. Ouija didn't fancy going all the way up to get this type of photo where you can see how the plane had crashed into the building. And besides, this one was taken days later. So on the day itself, he stayed on the pavement and took photos of the witnesses, which is what he always did. And one of the witnesses was this nun. Now, did she later go on to attack two people in the city in front of Gary Winogrand's camera? 
probably not. I should definitely just drop this now and move on. Now, uh, there are loads of Ouija photos of dead bodies. And this is, you know, one of the main things he's become famous for. And they obviously have a grim appeal and fascination. Ouija himself said that a crime scene with a body on it meant that he had two hours to get the shot and to get a shot that was different from the other photographers. This one, for example, is just astonishing. Look at the film title in the background there, Joy of Living, and the fact that the corpse is being covered in newspapers and tomorrow morning it will be in the newspapers. But to me, the dead people shots are the least interesting part of Ouija's work. Although it's also worth noting that he took so many dead people shots that sometimes you get those dead people shots confused with other shots he took of people sleeping. Are these bodies simply asleep? Or are they dead? Ouija loves to tease you with this ambiguity, and he even managed to do it twice with these great photos from the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parades, where he's got exactly the right angles to make it look like the giant inflatables are also murdered stiffs being examined by tiny policemen. So I'm just going to show you two more Ouija shots before we move on. The first one is this one, which always blows my mind, which is called Accident on Grand Central Station Roof, 1944. A car had crashed through the barrier of Park Avenue and ploughed into the roof below on the corner of 42nd Street and Vanderbilt Avenue. Um, and somehow, possibly by getting them to stand in place, who knows, Ouija managed to get two men sheltering there, oblivious to the danger just above them. And the final Ouija photo for now is this astonishing shot of the fire brigade tackling a blaze that is literally acting out the instructions for a frankfurter ad on the burning building which says simply add boiling water. The cynical amongst you might even think that Ouija had set this one burning himself or maybe it was started by a pyromaniac nun. But we're going to stop looking at Ouija for a bit because a this episode is in danger of running to about three hours and b because we need to turn to our next photographer and that's Enrique Metanides from Mexico City. So Ouija's main period of activity was 10 intense years between 1935 and 1945. And after that, he turned his attention elsewhere. He'd had enough of death and destruction. But just as Ouija was stopping, uh, Metanides was getting going and getting started. Which might sound wrong, given that he was only born in 1934. But the thing is that Metanides was a prodigy. And he was obsessed with photography and photographing bad luck, accidents and murder right from the off. His parents uh, came to Mexico from Greece and his father uh, briefly owned a camera shop and gave uh, Enrique a box brownie camera when he was just nine years old. And here is a photo of him as an adult with the same camera that he kept for the rest of his life. Uh, Metanides hardly ever threw anything away. And once he got that camera and took his first shots, that was it. He was hooked. So Ouija didn't uh, publish a photograph in a newspaper until he was in his mid thirties. Uh, Metanides got his first photograph published in a paper when he was just 12 years old. Um, he started taking photographs of car accidents on cinema screens when he was about nine or ten. His sister, uh, or his sister's husband I think it was, ran a cinema and he would obsessively take photos of the car crashes he saw in films and movies and then he went out onto the streets and graduated to the real thing. Here's some car crash photos he took when he was just 10 years old in 1944. And because of his extremely young age, he could get access where adults wouldn't be allowed. His father had now sold his uh, camera shop and had a restaurant and a local judge used to eat at the restaurant. And he saw Enrique's photos and subsequently gave him permission to attend accidents and crime scenes to take real photos. He became known as El Nino, the boy, and uh, brace yourself because now here's a photo he took aged just 10 of a man who had been beheaded, actually murdered by having his uh, neck placed on a train line. Um, and that photo was taken in a police morgue. You know, this is just extraordinary. Apparently firemen would uh, put him on their shoulders and carry him into burning buildings so he can get a better shot. Here he is, aged just 11 or 12, being shown one of his photos in a newspaper by an older photographer who had taken him under his wing. 
And just as Ouija had his most uh, productive and successful time working for one newspaper, PM Daily in New York, so Metanides uh, had an incredibly long and fruitful career with one Mexican newspaper, La Prensa. Now, La Prensa was a nota roja, which translates as red note or red news, and it's a kind of journalism very popular in Mexico. Uh, the newspapers are sensationalist and focus almost exclusively on stories about crime, accidents and natural disasters. Metanides, it should be pointed out, would also frequently help out in between taking his photographs. Here he is helping to rescue a child from yet another hideous accident. The sheer volume of bad luck, crime and natural disaster photographs that uh, Metanides took was really quite extraordinary. He once said that the only things he hadn't photographed were a submarine accident and an alien spacecraft crash. And it's also worth noting that uh, while Ouija had one very intense 10-year period between 1935 and 1945 to take his photographs, Metanides was taking this kind of photographs between uh, 1943 or 1944 right up until 1997 when he retired. So that's uh, over 50 years of photographing bad luck, heartache and grief. So he covered car crashes by the hundreds, train crashes, plane crashes. This one can't help but call up that Latige photo I showed you earlier on. And Metanides would never fly because of all the plane crashes he saw. He actually never left Mexico, I don't think. Um, he photographed suicides, murders by the bucketful, robberies. I mean, if it was awful, then he photographed it. I really don't think he photographed anything else. Although, annoyingly, for a man working in an overwhelmingly Catholic country, I haven't been able to find any bad luck nun photos he might have taken although he did always carry loads of Catholic trinkets and tokens to protect him, which seems to have worked. During his time as photographer, he was trapped in fires. He was almost shot. He once had a heart attack, got taken to the ER, and then started taking photos of another accident victim in the ER while he was being treated for his own heart attack. Um, I mean, it's worth pointing out, although it's probably obvious by now, that Metanides was quite an extreme character. He was also quite strange. He had a massive collection of lucky frogs, um, an even bigger collection of toy fire trucks and ambulances, and his house was full of 700 photo albums where he methodically cut out and filed clippings on various grim news stories from all over the world. But back to his photographs. Uh, my favourite, if that's the right word, is this one, which is just so surreal and shows 11-year-old Melania Chavez Camacho, who somehow has managed to get her hand stuck in an electric meat grinder at the market. The butchers have then had to dismantle the grinder as best they can and are in the process of rushing her to hospital, but not before Metanides popped up to take this bizarre photo. Although it's worth noting that this image was considered too tame for the front cover of La Prensa, which ran this more distressing one where the girl is crying instead. The real problem that I've had with doing this episode has been not with the subject matter of these photos, which I understand some people might find upsetting or too harsh to look at, but I think there's a, a certain kind of brutal, objective honesty to all of these images. They are just showing us the fragility of life and it's a fragility we quite often wish to sweep under the carpet or not look at. The actual problem I've had is just sorting through the sheer volume of them. You know, 50 years worth of this stuff is really just such a phenomenal amount to have to contend with. And like it or not, these photographs are fascinating precisely because they show us what happens when normality is suddenly torn apart and rearranged. Um, Metanides and Ouija's photos both have a kind of universality to them. Look at this one by Ouija taken on the 30th of July 1941 of Manuela Hernandez with the body of her husband in her lap in New York. And now look at this one by Metanides 
from Mexico City in 1995. These photos were taken 54 years apart, but the crimes and the responses are timeless. But the real uh, link between Metanides and Ouija are the way that both photographers would always try to include witnesses in their work. Here's a shot by Ouija called A Lifeguard and a Doctor Attempt to Save a Swimmer's Life in Coney Island, 1940. So let's go beyond the fact that the almost dead swimmer's girlfriend actually seems to be smiling for Ouija's camera. That could be just shock or who knows what. It's just a fraction of a second that has been frozen in time. What I find more interesting about this shot is the crowd behind her. Most of them are looking directly at the photographer. The crowd is witnessing the accident, is party to the bad luck, but they also want to be noted and included. They want to be in the papers. The voyeurism here is circular. Now, compare that shot of Ouija's with this one of Metanides, showing a 12-year-old cyclist who was killed and knocked down in 1968. Not a single person in the crowd is looking at the victim here. They are all staring at the camera, and we, the viewers, don't know where to look. Our eyes jump from the child and the blood on the ground to the audience of witnesses glaring back at us. Metanides has said that the thing that set him apart from the other photographers in Mexico was that he always tried to include the crowd in his shots. And some of these photos just defy belief. I mean, take a look at this one. Car crash, 1972. Again, I don't think anyone here is looking at the wreckage. The photographer is almost the real subject of the photograph. Or maybe we, the viewers, are. Well, look at this other one by Metanides from May 1955. Those faces peering in through the car window aren't looking at the victims. They're looking at the camera and back at us. And now compare that with this one by Ouija from the 1940s. It's an uncannily similar image. Well, this one, not only has Ouija got the accident victim being given a cigarette by his friend reflected in the wing mirror, but he's also got a set of eyes at the back there staring back at him. In fact, Ouija would even pretend to be a witness if no one else was around. When a body was found in a trunk and there was no one else to take a look, he even stood in for a witness to get a better shot. That's him acting as a member of the public. But Ouija was always looking for interesting crowd shots at crime scenes and fires, uh, something that would set him apart from the other pack of the photographers. So on Wednesday, October the 8th, 1941, he got a call over his scanner that there had been a murder and off he went. Um, and when he got there, he took a very different kind of crowd shot. While all the other photographers were busy getting the standard shots of the corpse, Ouija took this now incredibly famous photograph. And if you didn't know the context, this could simply be interpreted as a fantastic busy street scene. Without further information, we have no idea what's going on here. There's a crowd and it's hectic, but it could be that there's a parade or a celebrity passing by just out of shot. We have no way of knowing. And this ambiguity definitely gives the photograph a power. It poses a question that we can't answer. However, Ouija worked for a newspaper, and newspapers are meant to trade in facts and stories that can be corroborated. So because of that, we know a lot about this image. Here's what the original caption in the paper read. Pupils were leaving Public School 143 6th Avenue and Roebling Street in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn at 3.15 yesterday when Peter Mancuso, 22, described by police as a small-time gambler, pulled up in a 1931 Ford at a traffic light a block from the school. Up to the car stepped a waiting gunman who fired twice and escaped through the throng of children. Mancuso, shot through the head and heart, struggled to the board and collapsed dead on the pavement. Above are some of the spectators. The older woman is Mancuso's aunt, who lives in the neighbourhood, and the boy, tugging at the hair of the girl in front of him, is her son, hurrying away from her. Below is what they saw, as a priest, flanked by an ambulance doctor and a detective, said the last rites of the church over the body. So now we know the true horror behind this image, and Ouija, being a diligent photographer, also got the more expected shot of the body. Below is what they saw, and here is that photograph, but frankly, that is just yet another photo of a stiff on the pavement. They're ten a penny. Photos like these, though, are far more powerful and far harder to get, especially when you know the story behind them. Although this original photo still poses several questions. It has become famous under the title, Their First Murder, but I don't know who coined that title or when it was first applied. That's not how it was presented in the paper where it was called 
Brooklyn schoolchildren see gambler murdered in the street. And if you look at the double-page spread in Ouija's first book, Naked City, it's captioned, A woman relative cried, but neighbourhood dead-end kids enjoyed the show when a small-time racketeer was shot and killed, and that's juxtaposed not with the photo in the paper, but a different shot entirely, which could still be Mancuso. I have no reason to believe that it isn't, for which the caption reads, Here he is, as he was left in the gutter. He's got DOA tied to his arm. That means dead on arrival. I happen to think that Naked City is just as important a photo book as Frank's The Americans or William Klein's Life is Good for You, Good for New York, Trant's Witness Revels. It may not be as lauded, but it's just as accomplished. Ouija himself certainly thought so, because after Naked City was published and became successful, he effectively abandoned news and crime photography for good. He spent the next 20 years of his life trying to live off his notoriety, publishing numerous other books, hanging out in Hollywood, a movie producer optioned Naked City and made a fairly decent film noir out of it that had the distinction of all being shot on location in NYC. But Ouija isn't even credited in the titles or the poster. All they really did was steal the title. And although he himself got a few minor walk-on parts in B-movies, nothing else he did was ever as successful or enduring as that intense and manic time between 1935 and 1945. He did a long-standing series called Distortions, where he manipulated celebrities' photographs into weird shapes. He even did one of Show and Tell's old friend, the late Queen Elizabeth, who he seems to have given a hairy chest. He also promoted any kind of camera product that would have him, and sadly, he even ended up as a kind of sub-Benny Hill character, doing softcore porn shoots and films. This one. Personally, I had a hard time reconciling all this attention to alcoholic beverages, which I felt was driving me away from the meat of the subject. It wasn't until 1992, long after his death, that a uh, Hollywood proper came calling. Joe Pesci being perfectly cast in the public eye as Ouija in all but name. They called him Leon Bernstein, or Bernsey. Jeez, Bernsey. You scared me. I killed him to get the picture. The kid, put the hat in there. Huh? His hat, stick it in. People like to see the dead guy's hat. I'm a freelance photographer. The public eye. Now, what probably seems like several lifetimes ago, I said that I was going to be talking about three different photographers today, and it's high time that I mentioned and introduced the third one to you, who is called Andrew Savulik. Now, um, ironically, he's the only one of the three that's still alive, but he's the one that I know least about. Uh, he's not a self-promoter like Ouija, and his biographical detail is really quite light on the ground. Um, Ouija, like I mentioned, died in 1968. Uh, Metanides died uh, last year in 2022. Both of them uh, died of natural causes, not of hideous shootings or uh, disasters. But Savulik was born in 1949 in Pennsylvania, Although maybe it should be noted that like Ouija, he also has Ukrainian ancestry. So he's now in his early 70s. And he moved to New York in 1979. And for a while, he supported himself by doing construction work and by driving a taxi. And he studied uh, landscape architecture and painting and did a variety of things. But his hobby was photography. And um, in the early 80s, he bought himself a police scanner, very much like Ouija back in the 40s, and uh, that really transformed his photography. Um, he took tons of uh, really quite extraordinary photographs, but many of them were far too quirky for the newspaper editors to take. In 1993, he did get a job doing spot news for the New York Daily News, but by then he'd taken most of the photos that constitute um, his first and only book, which is this, which is called um, The City, uh, New York Spot News and Street Photography, 1980 to 1995, uh, which was published by Steidl in 2015 and remarkably is still uh, available and very, very affordable. And I would urge anyone who, who's been enjoying this episode to go and get a copy of this because it's absolutely fantastic. Um, incidentally, while I was doing the research for um, this episode, I came across this photo, which um, shows that in 2018, uh, Savulik was laid off by the New York Daily News, along with uh, half of their other staff, um, after it was taken over. So here's the photographer, he's the one on the right there, 
being the subject of a new story himself, although not a violent one, fortunately. Um, so like Ouija, there's one intense 15 year period, in this case, um, of work to concentrate on. And again, initially, like Ouija and Metanides, Savulik has the usual expected photos of dead bodies, bloody mugging victims, and car crashes that all the newspapers demand. I do know that uh, Savulik got a bit tired of the comparisons with Ouija when his book came out, but um, for me it's impossible not to mention the two photographers together. Although also I happen to think that Savulik is funnier and more sophisticated than Ouija. He's like a Ouija updated or Ouija 2.0. Remember Ouija's photo of the crashed car on the roof of Grand Central Station? Now take a look at this one by Savulik, also of Grand Central Station from 1990, where police are preventing a woman from jumping off the clock. It's just epic. Savulik has an uncanny knack for photographing jumping people, although that might just indicate how desperate people are today. Look at this one called God Tells Man to Take His Clothes Off and Climb Hotel. But just like Metanides and Ouija, Savulik also understands the value of focusing on witnesses, especially in the case of people up on high buildings. So this is people trying to see Jumper on hotel roof. And then this one is called Man Describes Seeing Woman Fall from the Roof of 11-Story Apartment Building. But Savulik's range is such that he can then also take a photo like this, Dorman cleaning up after suicide which is just quietly devastating. The ripped awning above and the patterns made by the mop are so powerful that you almost don't notice the dead body being ignored by everyone on the scene. Photographs like that make other more innocent photographs like this one become loaded with potential danger and peril. And it is here where Savulik and Ouija really are kindred spirits in that they simply have a wider scope than Metanides. Metanides only ever took photos of tragedy, accidents, murder and heartache. He really didn't photograph anything else at all for 50 or so years. Uh, whereas both Ouija and Savulik would take far more innocent, humorous and just everyday photos. Remember his book is called Spot News and Street Photos. So this is Man Putting Sheep Into Taxi by Savulik. And this is A Stitch in Time by Ouija at Coney Island in 1941. And this one is Men Confused About Spelling of a New Movie by Savulik. And here's Woman Watching Flying Trapeze Artist and Feeding Hot Dog to Man at Same Time, Madison Square Garden, New York 1943 by Ouija. And this is Man Delivers Bird Seed to Sex Shop by Savulik. There's a couple of other things that link uh, Ouija and Savulik together as kindred spirits. Uh, the first one is that Metanides would never include uh, another photographer in his photos. He would never take a photograph that acknowledged the presence of the pe press pack, or at least I haven't been able to find any. It was as if uh, Metanides wanted to be thought of as the only photographer out there. Ouija, however, was more than happy to acknowledge the competition and would happily take photos of them either posed or just as an unavoidable part of the scenery. So this one was taken of another photographer up on a police van at the site of their first murder, the photo I showed you earlier on, and there are absolutely loads more. And Savulik is the same. There's real competition out on the streets for these sort of images, and sometimes it's impossible to avoid other photographers. Whether that's crowds of bystanders all with their own phones and cameras, or the absolute crush of various news teams all competing for the money shot, or this absolutely extraordinary shot of a scanner buff taking a snapshot of a car wreck victim, which, like the car wreck in the back, really rips the lid off and exposes the harsh reality of this kind of photography. The other thing that links Ouija and Savulik is their use of captions. Uh, much, much earlier on, I showed you a photo of Ouija uh, at his car boot with his typewriter um, captioning some of his work. 
and we mentioned how a news photo necessitates a caption in order that we can understand its purpose or its truth. So here's one of Ouija's that is titled At an East Side Murder from 1943. And that lets us know what these people were witnessing, why they were all crowded together on the sidewalk like that. It helps distinguish it from a more innocent crowd shot, such as this, which was captioned Easter Sunday in Harlem, 1940. Two similar crowds, but each one is gathered for a very different purpose. Ouija's captions were often brutally simple and direct, like this. Alan Downs killed his wife, which could hardly be more basic. And once you've read it, you'll never look at that old man with his mysteriously bandaged hands in the same way ever again. But to me, Savulik has uh, elevated the writing of uh, simple and uh, matter-of-fact captions into an art form. So without its caption, this is a fairly average portrait. But then when you add the caption, man describing how he was forced to stab and kill the gang leader after going out to buy shampoo for his grandmother, it transforms the image completely. Now we know that this man has recently killed someone, this bloke here with his comb over, now you look at him in a totally different way. And what are his hands gesturing to? Is it the shampoo? or the knife, or something else, the caption answers one question, but raises so many more. Or this one. Man describes how seven-year-old boy was slowly sucked into a collapsing sinkhole. Did the kid live or die? The photograph alone can't tell us, and it's impossible to tell from the faces of the bystanders, but the words utterly transform the image. Savulik does this over and over again, providing concise captions that complement his images perfectly, whilst also raising many, many more questions. Elderly woman gets run over walking to the store. Taxi driver explaining how an argument with passenger caused him to drive into restaurant. Cousin of man who killed his wife's rapist with tire iron inside an elevator is interviewed by TV reporter behind his apartment door. Police give neighbors cat and hamster found inside apartment containing double homicide. And man learns that city officials will take his monkeys away. Which really is one of the saddest photos I've ever seen. Uh, and finally, I couldn't find uh, a nun photo by Savulik, but I did find this one, which is maybe the next best thing. Stolen from a Brooklyn church on Christmas, St. Bernadette was found dumped near the Belt Parkway. St. Bernadette is incidentally the patron saint of photographers, YouTubers and liars. Now, um, I'm going to show you just a few more photos because I figure if you've stayed this long, then you're all in and invested, right? Um, and it is just so interesting to me, this kind of photography, because it's so visceral and extreme. Um, uh, a thing that links uh, both Metanides and uh, Savulik is that they both worked in black and white and colour. Um, and obviously black and white can have the effect of lessening some of the shock effect of some of these photos. This photo, for example, would be very different in colour. And although colour can heighten our shock or revulsion, occasionally colour can also even have the effect of making some truly horrific images almost beautiful. Look at this one of Savulik's called truck overturns load of boulders on car, killing driver and passenger. It takes you some time to figure out exactly what's going on here. And then there's the constant battle between the aesthetic quality of the picture and the reality of what it's portraying. Similarly, there's this image by Metanides, taken in Mexico City, April the 29th, 1979. The dead woman here was called Adela Legareta Rivas, and she was a successful Mexican journalist. That morning, she had been to the beauty parlor to get her hair and her nails done. She wanted to look good for a press conference later that day where she would be presenting her new book. But on the way back from the beauty parlor, she was killed. She was hit by that white car in the background and Metanides was there to take this extraordinary photograph. Is this all too much? I don't know. It's real and it's tragic, certainly, but is it also somehow sublime? 
There's a poem by the English poet uh, Philip Larkin called Ambulances, which is all about the ubiquity of tragedy, in which he talks about the solving emptiness that lies just under all we do. And that, to me, is what photos like these contain and acknowledge. No one knows when their time is up, when their luck is up. It could be you or me. It could be anyone. That's the power of these photos. They reveal in stark focus just how fragile all our lives are. No one escapes death. That's why we look at images like this. That's why these photographs are also full of crowds staring. Because what's the alternative? Turn away? Don't look? Ignore reality and pretend it can't happen to you? Which ultimately is just deluding yourself. I want to end on this astonishing photo from Ouija's Naked City. Again, we don't know what this crowd has gathered to look at. It could be a fire, a celebrity, a murder or a parade. When you look closely though, Almost every face here looks solemn and reflective. It's as if they're all seriously contemplating the message on the banners in the background. Time is short. Every minute counts. And on that note and that thought, we've reached as good a place as any to finally end episode 13. My name is Stephen Leslie and this has been Show and Tell. If you've enjoyed, if that's the right word, this huge episode um, and are not now feeling terminally depressed, then uh, I'll also put some links down below and you can look at some more work by these amazing photographers. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, be careful out there. It's probably something I should say. Uh, they used to say that at Hill Street Blues, didn't they? Um, and I'll be back soon with another episode, which hopefully might be a little bit jollier. Um, yeah, so take care. See you soon. Goodbye.